Hi, right, welcome to Math 317. This is lecture 20, I believe. And so today we're going to be talking about multi-objective linear programming as well as linearizing polynomials. So the goal is to, again, continue to expand what we're able to do. So again, when you start learning a subject, you know, typically it's very limited. It has all these different restrictions that must be satisfied in order to use it. And what you want to show is that it is not as restrictive as you might see. So the main thing in multi-objective linear programming is you're going to frequently have multiple things that you care about. Is it typically possible to optimize all of them simultaneously? So can you give me an example? So anything in life where you have multiple competing things and you can't optimize both simultaneously. Okay, so this would be, you know, the convenience for all flyers that you can't come up with something that will be convenient for everyone. What if we only care about you? And of course, everybody in class should mean that you is just referring exactly to you and to no one else in this room. Can you give me an example of something just about yourself where we're not going to be able to optimize several things simultaneously? This is like the diet problem how good the meal tastes. Okay, how good the meal tastes versus. Versus how much it costs. So that's a great example that if you're trying to uh, have the cheapest possible diet that will keep you healthy, you know, it will not taste good. And, you know, I think the first time I taught this class, the students actually prepared the cheapest possible diet. They looked through all of the uh, health contents of the products at Stock and Shop, bought the stuff and actually brought it to class. It was disgusting. Yeah. If it's between that and dying, I would definitely choose that. But you are absolutely willing to trade a little bit of cost for better quality food or better tasting food. So the question is how much? And that's where the math comes in is you have to find some way to compare the different things. So today is a holiday in most of the country in all but I think one state. Uh, if anybody can figure out what the holiday is, just email me after class. Uh, does anybody know what movie this is from? I'll play a quick scene. Hopefully the volume will work. Thought you didn't have any high-priced talent. Forgot about Dorn because he's only high-priced. Uh, Picked him up as a free agent three years. So unfortunately, the, uh, the volume did not play well, even though it should be playing from you. Uh, basically, this is from the movie Major League. Uh, they are bringing plays in for spring training. And basically, each person who comes seems to be worse than the last. And the manager says as he sees this guy coming in, I thought you said we had no high price talent. Oh, don't worry about Dawn. He's just high price. Uh, another play coming in, you know, I wish we had him two years ago. We did four years ago, you know, because he's now been injured and whatnot. There's a reason why they're able to get these players. They're able to get these plays because there's something wrong with them. And that's why the other teams are not willing to go for them. So in general, you know, you have to make some kind of trade-offs. Let me try to slides. So you have to make some kind of trade-off if you want to do mathematics. And so we need to find a way to decide what we want and how much we want it. So let's say we're looking for a house. What might we care about if we're looking for a house? Location, location, location and location. But after the location, 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 what might come next? size and then maybe proximity to a school district that's good and so we need a way to compare these different things and so how do you compare size versus location and location of course could include you know school district also you know cost of the house how do you you need some way to put them in a common scale so let's say we have um, constraints 
let's say C1 transpose X, no constraints, sorry, um, objective functions. We have objective C1 transpose X dot, 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 CK transpose X. And these are what we care about. So we need some way to put them in an appropriate scale. And so this is the comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges. So we could do this in two steps. So the first is I'll put in some uh, scale factors. So it's you know, alpha one, C1 transpose X dot, 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 alpha K, CK transpose X to basically just convert them all to the same scale. Basically think of this as, you know, making everything in dollars. And for anybody who does anything in the business world, it's convenient that we convert the cost of everything to dollars. And then you can decide how much is it worth. Anybody know roughly how much a refrigerator costs? Within a fact of two. $1,000 within a fact of two, perfect. I will give you $2,000 if you will go without a refrigerator freezer for an entire year. Is that worth it? Not even close, right? How much does your you know, cell phone net plan cost? You know, I'll double that, but you can't use your cell phone net plan data plan for an entire year. So just because we put a monetary cost on it, it might be worth a lot more to you than what that cost is. And then you can have huge conversations as well, why is it sold at that level? Well, because there's a lot of people who can supply it. And so when you think about how much it costs to supply, they can get away with you know, charging that amount, but you would be, I think, foolish to go without a refrigerator. Oh, again, if you're a college student, maybe it's not so bad you know, to go without a refrigerator freezer for a year. Uh, but once you're outside of college and you have a home, you know, to not be able to store things overnight is a huge problem. So by converting everything to a common unit, a common scale, it makes it much easier to compare. So we'll assign a dollar, dollar value to everything. The next we're going to do is we're going to then assign weights. So lambda one, alpha one, C one, transpose X, dot, 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 lambda, K, CK, transpose X. And what do you think should be true about these weights? So we have a bunch of factors I need to assign weights. What do you think the weight should represent? Value. Value in what sense? That the location might be more valuable. Okay, good. Right. So, so, so where do you think these weights live? What kind of numbers are they? Between zero, between zero and one. So not only are they between zero and one, but what else can you tell me about them? And without loss of generality, what else can you say about them? One. They should. If they don't sum to one, you can always, let's say they sum to two, then just divide everything by two and you'll still have non-negative weights and now they'll sum to one. So as long as the weights are non-negative, you can always rescale. So why not just assume that the weights sum to one? And so now we have a problem like this. And so now the new objective is going to be um, lambda one C one transpose X plus dot 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 plus lambda K C K transpose X. Is this a fine objective function? We can just write this as some new vector. I'll call it your know, curly C transpose X. Okay. What would curly C be? So what would that vector curly C equal? All 
of like the weighted values that we come up with. So let's 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 be explicit. So you know, here it is again. So what would curly C equal? You have to tell me what is that vector? I dropped, whoops, uh, I dropped on the previous page. I forgot I, put, I had the alphas. What, what would that vector C be? Yeah, lambda one, alpha one, C one, transpose plus dot 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 plus lambda k, alpha k, c k transpose. All we did is we changed the objective function. It's the same now as a regular canonical linear programming problem. The only thing that's changed is the objective function that we use. So the same techniques we had before will work now. The only difference is what we apply it to, is we now apply it to a different objective function. So it's really not that hard to handle multiple objectives. What we need to do is we need to first find a way to compare apples and oranges. So we convert them to a common scale. And then we need to decide how much everything matters. Not everyone is going to have the same uh, preferences. So it's actually possible for uh, different people to be led to very different solutions because of their different uh, preference structures. But now that we have it as just one equation, we're fine. Now, where do you get the lambdas? You get the lambdas from your know, individual preference. So these are given, these are numbers that come into the program. Uh, a situation which we might discuss later in the semester is allocating assets in a divorce. When you're allocating assets in a divorce, do you think each person values each asset equally? No. So it's actually possible for each person to believe they get more than 50% of everything. You know, someone might value the house very highly. Someone might value the car very highly. Someone might value, and so on and so on and so on. So you need to know what these lambdas are. And once you have it, voila. I, I am using lambda deliberately. Does this remind you of anything from multivariable calculus? It's usually not covered. Uh, when I teach 150, I might have one or two quick aside remarks on this, but it's a generalization of something you've seen in multivariable calculus. So can you think, where have you seen a lambda in multivariable calculus? Eigenvalues. Not eigenvalues, Lagrange. Lagrange multipliers. What are Lagrange multipliers? We've actually seen them in this class as well. So for Lagrange multipliers, this is constrained optimization. So let's say I have some surface and this is the surface say G of X equals C. And then at each point in the surface, I have my normal. And so here's the normal and that's in the same direction as the gradient of G. And then if I have my function F, you know, here's the gradient of F. And if I want to be at a, bless you, at a candidate for maximum or minimum, I need the gradient of F to have nothing um, perpendicular, there's nothing tangent to the surface. The gradient of F needs to be in the same direction as the normal. So, candidates for max min have gradient of F parallel to gradient of G, i.e. there exists a lambda such that the gradient of F is lambda gradient of G. More generally, you could have multiple constraints. Maybe we want G1 
of x dot dot dot, well, sorry, of x equals c1 dot dot dot, gk of x equals ck, then we would need the gradient of f to equal lambda one gradient of g1 plus dot 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 plus lambda k gradient of gk. How many people have seen this in multivariable calculus? It's usually not done. When I teach, I might make just one or two very quick sentences about how you would generalize Lagrange multiplies. It makes sense that there should be such a generalization. And what we're basically saying is that you can't have anything tangent. So all of you has to lie, you know, normal to the surface. All of your change, you know, the pointing of gradient of F has to be normal to the surface. So this is somewhat similar to that. And we have a span here. The difference here, of course, is the lambdas don't have to be non-negative. They don't have to add up to one. You know, for us, adding up to one is not a real big deal. You can always get that by just rescaling. The fact that they're non-negative, what would it mean if one of your lambdas was negative? So if it's a positive, that tells you how much you like it. If it's a negative, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure exactly what a negative lambda would mean when we're trying to assign weights. You know, if you really don't like something, um, maybe you could talk about maybe changing the sign of the quantity. And just if you, if you want to allow maybe a negative lambda, maybe look at making something negative so that the larger that is, the worse it is for you. All right. Any questions about this? So again, in practice, the only difficulty is figuring out the individual preferences. And when you are trying to buy a house, you know, years from now, for many of you, it's not going to be easy as you try to decide, I have all these different things that I care about, and I have to decide how much am I willing to trade off? Uh, what's one decision in your life where you might have had to make a trade-off like this sometime in the last three or four years? College. College, right? You might have to trade financial packages. You might have to trade playing time on a team. You might have to trade geographic location. You might have to trade your know, depth of classes or faculty-student ratio. There's lots of different factors. Uh, for me, one of the big factors was, oh, I gotta be careful because this is being recorded, or whether or not anybody from my high school has been to that school within four years. It was nice to be able to start fresh without people knowing. It would have also been nice to have had you know, a friend at a school that I go to. You know, is it near family? So you have all these very difficult things and it's really hard to figure out what these lambdas should be. And so again, just going forward in life, just be aware of this when you're making choices and really stop and think honestly, how much do things really matter? A lot of times people end up focusing on things that just don't change the value by that much. And you just get so concerned about it. Uh, one of my favorite examples is sometimes people get upset about how much it costs to ship things on Amazon, that you, know, you have something that costs like a penny or 25 cents, and it's $1.99 for shipping. The item costs $2. Is $2 a good deal? Don't focus on the individual components. All right. So the thing for today is linearizing polynomials. So some polynomials are very easy to write as a linear function. Can somebody give me an example? So how is that easy to write as a linear function? Yeah, so let's try, you know, y equals x or 3x or 4x minus, seven, well, no. let's do 6x minus 5 in honor of yesterday. Okay, so here are your know, bunch of functions. It's very easy to write this as a linear function. What about harder? Y equals x squared. When you look at y equals x squared, is there any way that this should be able to be written as a linear function? Well, but, but the, so I, I, 
I'm not disputing that its derivative can be written as a linear function. I'm not disputing that locally it can be approximated by a linear function, but I'm saying the function x squared, should you be able to write x squared as a linear function? Yes or no? No, if you could write x squared as a linear function, if linear, any polynomial is linear. So how can we get any polynomial is linear from just x squared is linear? So it's always good to just stop and think, what will be the consequences of some results? Are some results too good to be true? So if you can prove x squared is linear, that if you can linearize x squared, you can linearize anything. So what would come next after x squared? X cubed. How should we write X cubed? X times X squared, which is linear times linear as X squared is linear by assumption. And then this would be linear by assumption. So if we could linearize x squared, we could linearize x cubed. If we can linearize x cubed, x to the fourth is not gonna be that much harder. So I'm going to assume everybody is comfortable plotting quadratic functions. And we're all convinced that this is not linear. So there is no way that we're going to be able to make a quadratic function linear. So we have to, change our sites. We can make it linear at a cost, and we're not gonna be able to make every quadratic function linear, but only certain ones. So when we did, uh, let's see. We have not done, have we done Horner's algorithm yet in this class and fast multiplication? Do we do Horner's algorithm? That's the one with parentheses, right? Okay, so we, we talked about Horner's algorithm, that if I give you a polynomial of degree D, how many operations does it take to evaluate it? It's, we only care about multiplications, it's D, D plus one over two. So it's basically quadratic in the degree. And in applications in cryptography, D could often be of size 10 to the 400. That's bad enough, but now you have to square it. You know, we're talking 10 to the 800, you know, no chance in hell of doing it. Horner's algorithm, gives you a way to evaluate polynomials in linear time with the degree. Well, that's nice, but your 10 to the 400 is still beyond anything we have a prayer of doing. But if you happen to have a monomial, a very special function, just one term, then we can use fast multiplication or repeated squaring, whatever you wanna call it. And now it runs in essentially the log of D. And the log of 10 to the 400, that's under a thousand. That's doable. Oh, around, it's around a thousand. That's doable. Okay, how does that help us here? Maybe we're not going to be able to linearize all polynomials. So let's consider a polynomial f of x where x is in z intersect minus n n. So what does this mean? It means we're only going to evaluate our polynomial at integers and the integers live between minus n and n. So if you think about a lot of things we're doing in linear programming, this is not a huge restriction. You know, most things we're looking at are going to be bounded. We do not have unlimited resources. You know, n might be a tremendously large number, but it will be a bounded number, it'll be a finite number. The fact that it's integer is a bit more serious. So can somebody give me an example of a problem where the integer solution can be very different from the real solution? You know, what's our go-to problem for that? The knapsack problem. So if you can continuously vary the amount in your backpack, 
it's going to be very different than if you have discrete amounts. However, if the discrete amounts become smaller and smaller and smaller, it's effectively becoming a continuous problem. And the differences will become negligible. You know, for the version of the problem we did, you know, the backpack could only hold, I think, 150 pounds, and the three objects had weights of 51, 50, and 50. So if you change by one unit, that is a huge swing in weight. Imagine that the weights of the three objects were one over 10 to the 50th, and just a little bit less than one over 10 to the 50th. It's now so close to being able to do things in a continuum that now the the integer solution would be extremely close to the real solution. So for many problems in the limit, as your discreteness gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it really will approach the continuous. The problem of course, is it's only for real integer programming that we have a good method. For integer programming, we do not have fast algorithms that will get us to the answer, but they'll get us close. So the first question is, how do we want to look at our variable x? So x is, let's do that. So x is an integer in the interval minus n to n. Well, let's do it as minus you know, two to the n to two to the n. Okay. I'm going to write x as a sum um, let's say a k two to the k k goes from zero to n minus one each a k is in negative one zero or one. So I'm just writing my numbers in binary. Right? Is everybody comfortable with this? So if all the A's are one, I will get a number that's just less than uh, two to the N. So maybe I'll just use open intervals to be safe. So strictly between. Okay. So how many variables does it take me to write the variable X? We replace one integer variable X with how many binary variables? Or I guess maybe there, you know, that I guess the ternary variables. So how many variables would this cost us? N. Right? We have a zero, a one dot dot dot, a n minus one. So at the cost of using more variables, I can now assume that my variable X is just integers, not just integers, but negative one, zero, or one. Okay. Oops. Without loss of generality, could shift. So X is in zero, two to the N minus one. That's no, right, two to the end. 
So each AK is in zero one is binary. And the reason is we know, so I mean, technically if I'm using the same thing here, it should be two to the two N, but I could just add basically negative, I'm sorry, I could add you know, two to the N to all of my X's. And so now if X was negative, it's not gonna be shifted to become positive. I'm just shifting everything down. So if, I, if my number was, you know, say negative 17 and I'm adding 32, now my number would be positive 15. If my number was 17 and I'm adding 32, it would now be 49. So without loss of generality, if I have an integer between negative n and n, the first thing I can do is just add a constant to everything, just add positive n to everything, so that now everything lives between zero and two n. And one of the things we often do in high level math is we just abuse notation and we don't keep changing the variable. And so now this little n would not be the same as that little n, it's really you know, a two n over here. Or no, I'm sorry, it's really an n plus one, sorry, because we've doubled things. We just added two to the n to all. So is everybody comfortable with this? That without loss of generality, if I have a polynomial, I can assume that my number x can be written as a sum of binaries. Okay, well, let's see what this means now. We have f of x is, let's say it's the sum of alpha l x to the l, l goes from zero to d, and x is the sum, k goes from zero to n minus one of two to the k times a k. And these are my binary variables. Okay. So let's expand things out. Do you agree that I only have to understand what's going on with x to the L for some L? That if I can show x to the L is linear, everything is linear. So let's study L equals two for concreteness. So we need to study A, sorry, the sum K equals zero to N minus one, two to the K A K times the sum um, let's call it j equals zero to n minus one, two to the j a j. And of course we have the coefficient outside um, a two. Why don't I use k for the second sum? So why don't I use K for the second sum, I'm squaring things. This is supposed to be, you know, alpha two X squared. So this is alpha two, this is X, this is also X. Why am I not using the same subscript? It wouldn't be wrong to use the same subscript as long as I keep these things in parentheses and separated from each other. And here, K is a local index. It's just for that part. And the second one, local index just for this part. What I wanna do is I wanna multiply everything out and say this is just alpha two, which I don't really care about. And it's the sum K goes from zero to N minus one. The sum of J goes from zero to N minus one two to the k plus j, a k, a j. If I had the same dummy variable for both of them, this would be problematic at this point. Okay. It's really almost like a double integral. You need to use a different variable for each direction. 
Okay, so does everyone agree we just have to understand a k times a j? What are the possibilities for k and j that we need to worry about? There are two distinct possibilities for the pair k and j. What are the possibilities? Okay, so that, that's actually talking about the product. So there's only two possibilities for the product that it's zero or one. What are the possibilities for the indices for the pairs K and J? Because there's two major classifications. They're the same or they're different. What we want to do is, you know, we want to study A K A J. For case one, K equals J. So we have a k a k is a k squared. But what is a k squared equal? So these are binary variables. They take on the values zero and one. Zero, one. Okay, but be more specific. Can you relate a k squared to a k? It's the same, right? as a k is in zero one, so a k squared is a k. So binary variables are awesome, okay? This is a tremendous, tremendous property. You know, I'm trying to think of them as indicators. You either have it or you don't have it. I'm gonna ask you again, do you have it or not? My answer is not gonna change. Doesn't matter how many times you ask me, you know, if I said initially I have it, I still have it. Okay. So no matter how many times you keep asking and asking and asking. So I, I read a variety of you know, books. If anybody has a book they think I should read, please let me know. I'm always on the lookout. I'm reading a book about the very interesting presidential election in 1920, where you have, I think, six people who served as president in consideration. And at one point they're trying to draft somebody and they're reporting just one side of the phone call. No, 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 yes, no. And when he hangs up, the person says, wait, you said no to everything but one question. What was the one question you said yes to? He asked me if I heard him properly. And I said, yes, I've heard you. I do not want to run. So binary variables, doesn't matter how many times you multiply them. What would AK cubed be? AK. Okay. So this is going to be very easy. So if I have the square of a binary variable, it's still binary. So powers of binary variables are linear. Okay. Now we have to handle the harder case. And again, if we had used the same index over here, we might actually be confused and think that you're only gonna have AK squared, AK times AK. So now we have to do case two, K does not equal J. So we have AK, AJ, and what are the possible values for AK, AJ? Zero or one. Ooh, what does that mean must be true about AK, AJ? What kind of variable is it? Binary. So replace with what did you call that new binary variable? Give me a name, a good name. So again, why is big F a great notation for the antiderivative of little f? You can tell they're related. And doesn't it look bigger, like you're somehow building up from it? F prime is a good notation for derivative. It means it's coming from. When you look at it, you can see the relation. So what letter should we use for our variable to show that it's coming from the AK and the AJ? 
I would say A would be a really good letter, and let's just call it A sub KJ. And this has two indices, so it's clearly different than the AK and the AJ. Now, AKJ equals one or zero. When does it equal one? Okay. If and only if AK and AJ equal one, and when is it zero? Otherwise. So we can say if AK plus AJ equals two, then AKJ equals one, else AKJ equals zero. Does this remind you of anything? Yeah, which code? Not mod two. When have we done something like this in class? So if this condition holds, then we define a variable to be this, else we define it to be this. Yeah, what, what part of integer programming? Yeah, so these were the logical constraints. It costs more variables, but it is linear. Okay. So we can actually replace the product AKAJ with a new variable that's linear at the cost of adding more variables. Usually this is not going to be a good trade. If your problem is sufficiently small, then this is not horrible. But for anything that's really complicated, where you have a lot of different integer powers, you just think about how many variables you're going to have to introduce, how many more constraints you're gonna to have to introduce. Then we have to introduce variables just to introduce the new variable AKJ. So we're not just introducing the variable AKJ, we're introducing variables to allow us to get to the variable AKJ. Okay. Although maybe that AKJ might be that new variable Z that we introduced. So maybe it's not so bad, maybe it's just bad, not so bad. But you're gonna to have to introduce a lot of binary variables. So we can linearize polynomials. So what this means is that we actually can handle more general objective functions if we wanted to, but at a cost of turning things from a potentially real integer programming problem to a binary integer programming problem. And binary integer programming problems are much harder to solve but it's at least doable. And then of course, the next question is, what happens if you have cubic terms and higher? If have x cubed, do it as x squared times x, rather than repeat. So for example, um, here's a nice theorem, the derivative of a finite sum is the finite sum of derivatives. It's not necessarily the case if you have an infinite sum. Proof, do n equals two directly. So f plus g prime is f prime plus g prime. And the proof of this is not too bad. You know, we look at you know, the limit as h goes to zero of f plus g of x plus h minus f plus g of x over h is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h plus the limit as h goes to zero of g of x plus h minus g of x over h. This is using the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits, which is true so long as the limits are finite. 
and the limits are finite because the derivatives exist. And this is just f prime of x plus g prime of x. So this proves in the case when n equals two, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Again, this is a pre-core class. I'm not expecting you to be able to do proofs like this, but I wanna start preparing you for those of you who are going to go on to real analysis to start seeing some rigorous proofs. Now, for n equals three, we can write f plus g plus, I apologize for using h. How do you wanna write f plus g plus h? You have two choices that I will accept. We wanna reduce it to a sum of two functions because we know the derivative of a sum of two functions is the sum of the two derivatives. So how can I write this as a sum of two functions? So I've got f plus g plus h. How can I write this as a sum of two functions? Yes. What is the wrong way to write it? Oh, so instead of doing it this way, how else could you do it? Yeah, f, I mean, f plus h plus g, oh, that's just wrong. You know, there's no, no one would ever do that. Now, f plus g plus h, that, sure, you can justify doing that. But f plus h, no, no one would ever be caught doing that. Now, because this is just two functions, this is just f plus g prime plus h prime. As sum of two. But what do we know about f plus g prime? Right, and I'm gonna keep this in the parentheses because at this point, um, that's all we have. You know, I'm only applying the fact that it's a sum of two functions inside there. And now we can drop the parentheses and just use properties of arithmetic. This is now f prime plus g prime plus h prime. What law is this? I would say associative. That when I write you know, addition, it doesn't really matter which way I add the terms, it's always gonna work out. And so this would be the proof that if you know the sum of two functions, that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives, you can extend it to the sum of three. You can extend it to any finite sum. You cannot extend it to infinite. So works for any finite n. All right, so this is a good place to stop. So we showed how to use some theory. We showed how we can linearize, even though it may not be a good idea.